I told you to leave. I lost my job almost a year ago and finding a new one had been pretty difficult. I'm an engineer with 10 years of experience, but it seems that I'm overqualified for any of the positions I have postulated myself. I was starting to become really desperate. I had managed to save a little bit of money, but I was already running out of it. I'm not a burglar or anything, but I was starting to have some really bad ideas how to get some money to bring food home. Luckily for me, a friend informed me of a job opening on the construction of a new subway line. I checked the professional profile, and although it wasn't what I liked the most, I had experience on the subject and applied for the job. I had an appointment for the next day at 10 a.m. for a face-to-face -face interview with the person that would be my boss. Knowing how difficult it is to navigate my city, I left home pretty early and arrived 45 minutes before the agreed time. I entered the building and went to the lady at the front desk to announce myself. She told me to go to the office 15 of the 13th floor and wait until Mr. Richards, who was going to be my interviewer, fetched me. I did as I was told and sat on the bench outside. I still had 35 minutes before my appointment when an old man sat next to me. He seemed around 70 to 75 years old and was leaning on a cane. As he sat, he exhaled deeply, as someone who is extremely tired. He looked at me with very kind eyes and asked me if I was there for an interview with Mr. Richards. I nodded. He smiled a bit and told me that I looked really nervous. I explained to him that I hadn't had a job for almost a year and I really needed to perform very well on that interview to land the position. The old man told me that all was going to be fine and not to worry about it. I threw a sad smile and told him, I wish it were that easy. The man paused for a while, then he said, I know Mr. Richards from a long time ago, just be honest with him. After that, he stood up and left, but not before saying, the job will be yours, have faith. Two minutes later I got called by Mr. Richards. I followed the man's advice, relaxed and was honest. It all went smoothly. He even congratulated me and told me that he had appreciated my honesty during the interview. I told him that I had to be honest and I had followed an old man's advice and proceeded to describe him. Mr. Richards changed his expression and grabbed a portrait he had on his desk that was facing him. He turned it around and asked me, Is this the man? Yes, it's him, I answered. He smiled, and after a while, I saw a tear coming out of his left eye. My dad always wants to help me. It's not the first time he does it. He comes here and gives advice to people. Even now, ten years after his death, he keeps coming to help me, to make sure I make good decisions and surround me with the best people I can. When I was 15, I wanted to earn some money to be able to buy a video game console. My father told me that I had to start to work to know how difficult it was and to understand the value of money. I started to do many different chores in our neighborhood. You know, what kids usually do, mowing lawns, running errands, walking dogs, and many other stuff. Before long, I had managed to save enough money for my council and had quite a bit for myself. I was starting to like this business of having my own money, so I kept on doing it. Babysitting is not a job usually given to boys, but I had a cousin that his father went on a business trip for a full month, and his mother had to work a night shift for a full week. She offered me to stay with him, since I was on vacations and could earn a little extra. They lived right in front of my house, so it was just perfect. The night they started, the little boy, who was four at the time, came straight to me 
and looked at me seriously for a few seconds before saying, Bobby doesn't like you. Bobby wants you to leave. When I asked him who Bobby was, he just replied, My friend, he's over there. He pointed to a corner of the living room that was obviously empty. I don't like Bobby either. Tell him to go away. He left to the corner he had pointed and started to whisper as if he was having a conversation with someone. At 9 p.m., according to my aunt's instruction, was his bedtime. I told the little boy and he went to his bedroom. After he had changed to his pajamas and was tucked under his bed sheets, he told me again. Bobby doesn't like you. He says he hates you. He wants you to leave. Well, tell Bobby to get used to me because I'm going to be here for a long time. As I was leaving the room and closing the door behind me, I heard him one last time. He says he warned you. I went downstairs, sat on the couch and turned on the TV. Everything was normal for a while until a rasping voice whispered in my ear. I told you to leave. I jumped out of the couch and turned around, and I will never forget what I saw. A human figure of around seven feet was standing before me. It was all red and black, with yellow eyes and horns. It was very thin, and its snake-like tongue was permanently coming out of its mouth. I have no idea how I did it, but I ran out straight to my house, banging the door and yelling for my parents to open it. My father opened the door, and when I calmed down, I described what had happened. He went for my cousin and burned into our place. The boy didn't seem to find weird my description of the thing I saw, and when we asked him about it, he just said, That was Bobby, and he said he didn't like you. He's back there waiting for me. Many years later, when I dared to ask him about his friend, he told me that Bobby one day arrived, and one day when he was six, he simply left. He was very young and didn't know that his appearance was horrifying, but he said something that until this day still gives me creeps. Bobby told him that someday he will be back. I used to take my little girl to the park twice a week. We had just moved to this city and she needed new friends. She was a very shy girl and the psychologist told me that the park was the best place for her to socialize and meet new friends. For the first two or three weeks she was always alone on the seesaw, on the swings or sitting next to me. Then I started to get really concerned because although she was started to talk with other kids and even had several playdates with a few of them, she always wanted me to take her to the park because her best friend was waiting for her. When I asked her who her little friend was, she always answered me. Daddy, the little girl on the swings. The white one with the black eyes and the old dress. Her name is Evie. The problem was that I was always saw her alone in the swings. I asked her psychologist about it and she told me that she had created an imaginary friend and that was very normal. One day, when we were at the park, she was chatting happily with her imaginary friends on the swings. I came close to her and told her that it was time to leave. She said goodbye to the empty swing and stood there watching. After a few seconds, her expression became sad and said, Okay, Evie, it's okay. I will visit you. I promise. She turned to me and then said, Evie says she cannot come here anymore, but she wants me to pay her a visit once in a while. She says we pass every day in front of her house on our way here. Can we go now, Daddy? She was looking at me with puppy eyes, and I would do anything to see my daughter happy. So I agreed. I still regret that decision to this day. We were walking back home, and about halfway my girl stopped suddenly. There! There's where he believes! I turned towards where she was pointing, and my heart froze. She was pointing to a cemetery. Come, Daddy, let's see Evie's house. She was dragging me towards and inside the place. She was navigating the place like she knew it, although she had never stepped a foot in there. Then, 
after a few minutes of walking, she stopped in front of a tombstone. It was a really beautiful one and had an angel on top. The stone said, Eve Kershaw, 2000, 2005. I was transfixed and was drawn to reality by the voice of my daughter, which seemed to come from far away. Daddy? Daddy! Evie says she will not be able to meet again, that she will go forever, but that she is happy that finally found a friend. And after a while, she also said, and she wants to thank you for letting me be her friend. I turned to the stone and back again, saw my daughter and nodded. From that day on, at least once a week, we go and visit Evie's tombstone, the girl who met a friend after her death. If you reached this far, please give us a like, consider subscribing, activate notifications, and follow us on social media. Soon, we'll be back with more Inside the Cleft of the Mansions.